قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري قرآني طوق نجاتي قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري قرآني طوق نجاتي قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري قرآني طوق نجاتي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد We continue with this very interesting discussion of ours relating to Surah Kahf Today we are going to talk a little bit about the questions that were asked by the Qurayshi emissaries when they met Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We discussed the three questions that the Jews asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Jews asked these questions for dubious, sneaky and undercutting reasons. These are people of the book. They have knowledge who messengers are. They know that all the messengers that were sent by Allah had the same message. In other words, all the messengers of Allah had the same message. Who is Allah? What is the role of the human being on earth? What is the relationship that the human has with Allah? What is going to happen to the human after he dies? These are fundamental religious questions that would have made more sense for them to ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They did not ask any of these fundamental questions through their three questions. If somebody was able to answer all of their questions or all of their three original questions correctly, would that mean that they are messengers? Just to recap the questions that they asked, about the people that got missing, that is the sleepers of the cave. They also asked about the man that traveled between east and west, which is Dhul Qarnayn. And they asked about the ruh, the soul. Now, if somebody was able to answer these questions correctly, would that mean that they are a messenger? No, it wouldn't. These questions have nothing to do with validating someone or invalidating someone as a, mess, as a messenger, especially if they come from the background of Jewish scholarship. If you recall, the Arabs, the Quraysh of Mecca, sent these emissaries to the learned scholars of Medina so that they can verify whether Rasulullah was the messenger of Allah. And the Jews said, ask him three questions. The Jews, the scholars, were not genuinely interested in finding out whether or not he is a messenger. They are interested in convincing the Quraysh that he is not a messenger, so hopefully they will end up killing him. They do this because it angered them and offended them that the word of Allah went to an Arab. They are trying to sabotage the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They asked about Dhul Qarnayn, a man that traveled east to west. Dhul Qarnayn is a mysterious figure in history. Up until now, there is disagreement about who he is. If the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Dhul Qarnayn is this guy, and this is who he was, there would have been many other people that would have disagreed with him and said, it was someone else. Today, there are more than 40 opinions on whom Dhul Qarnayn is. Now the Jewish scholars are hoping that the Prophet wasallam comes up with an opinion on this issue because once he opens up and he says something, he is going to get tangled in that controversy. 
So they specifically asked a question regarding which there was no consensus or absolute information about. Dhul Qarnayn, who was he? And if the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have said anything, they would have easily responded by saying, this is not who or what we meant. They also asked about the ruh, the soul. Now the word ruh is used for many things. It is used for the soul of the human being. It is used for what Allah places in the human when the child is in the belly of the mother. It is also used for Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam as it is used for the Quran. So the word ruh could mean many things. It could mean the Quran. It could mean Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam. It could mean that which Allah places in the fetus whilst it is in the belly of the mother. It could mean the soul of a grown human. So they specifically asked a question, knowing that if the Prophet ﷺ answers, the possibility is that he may answer something and we may say, but that's not what we meant. So if the Prophet answers one of these, it would be correct. But they could say, no, that's not what we meant. We meant the other ones. The idea was to trap him. Because the word ruh is ambiguous. The reality of the human soul is difficult to understand. It is difficult to comprehend. Allah says, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُوْتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا they ask you about the soul. Say, the soul is something from the command of my Lord. And you are not given from the knowledge but a little. So the word ruh is all part of Allah's command. He did not end up opening the topic. If the Prophet ﷺ answers one of these, it would be correct. But they could say, no, no, that's not what we meant. We meant the others. Again. The idea here was to trap the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They also asked, tell us about the young man who disappeared a long time ago, meaning the people of the cave. Now, let us understand, the people of the cave have nothing to do with the Jews. It is a story celebrated by Christians. It doesn't occur in the Bible. It doesn't occur in the New Testament. By the best Christian records, the people of the cave were discovered about 120 years before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born. The Jews say the Prophet will know about this obscure discussion that the Christians are having if he is really a prophet. What the Christians believe of the saint or of the saints regarding the sleepers of the cave, and we will come in detail about it later, is directly in contrast to the concept of Tawheed in Islam. So if the Prophet wasallam does agree to know about them, then he is stumped because he will end up violating Tawheed. So Allah revealed. So these were the questions they asked. And the idea was to trap the Prophet ﷺ. Ask him things where there is ambiguity. Ask him things about what there aren't or there is not one conclusive response that can be given. However, Allah revealed the entire surah as a response to those three questions. What is the surah responding to? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does not know anything about the people of the cave. Allah has that knowledge. The Christians have some detailed knowledge and the Jews have some vague knowledge. What do the Christians know of the people of the cave? It is their story and they celebrate it. 
So the Quran came as a record to correct the older record, and that is why the story of the Quran with relate, in relation to the sleepers of the cave would be different. And this was something that I felt was necessary for us to understand. The Christian version of the story. What is the Christian version of the story? The sleepers of the cave were proof of resurrection of the body and the soul. Inshallah, when we get back, we will continue to discuss the relationship and the backdrop upon which the Quran Kareem revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the surah the detailed story of the people of the cave. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The story of the people of the cave, as we had just spoken of before the break, is proof of the resurrection of the body and the soul. Because these young men died and were in heaven, they were considered martyrs that have the opportunity to intercede on your behalf in accordance to the Christian theology. So the Christians prayed to them. Now the history of the story. Let's talk a little bit of the history of the story. The earliest records in Christian writings are found in the Greek, the original languages were lost. 120 years before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is born, the people experience the waking up of the sleepers. Within the century of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's birth, 571, this story became popular in the Arab world. There are biblical details of the incident, but there are parts that the Quran doesn't agree with, and there are parts that are perfectly aligned with the Quran. The Christian story has many elements that make logical sense. The dates, the names of the kings, details that explain a lot of the practices of the Christians in the, in the region, the kind of shirk which makes sense if you put it together with the Roman Empire. So it was in this backdrop that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the story. So Allah says, Nahnu, we in fact, Nahnu is a pronoun. So Allah is saying, we in fact, are going to give you the correct details of the story. So Allah does not need to use this pronoun of Nahnu. He doesn't have to be using it because you can say, Naqussu alayk, we will tell you the, st the story accurately. However, Allah says, Nahnu, which suggests that we in fact and only we are going to be telling what actually happened with them. In other words, Allah is imposing in the Quran that they have the wrong version. And Allah is going to reveal the correct version. Now, if we come back to the surah, there are four stories discussed in the surah. The surah discusses the story of the people of the cave, the story of the believing young men who were living in a disbelieving environment, in a disbelieving country. They decided to leave their homes and run away with their religion after they were faced with a confrontation between them and the people. Allah rewarded them with the mercy of the cave and the care of the sun. They woke up to find that the entire village were believers. This is in a nutshell a brief 
of the first story, which is the story of the cave. The second is the owner of the two gardens. It's the story of a man who Allah had blessed, but who had forgotten the one who blessed him. He transgressed and had doubts in his faith. He was not grateful for his blessings, even after he was reminded of it. As a result, he lost all of his bounties. Then we have the story of Musa and Khidr alayhi salatu was salam. Musa alayhi salatu was salam was asked, being a Nabi, being a prophet, was asked, who is the most knowledgeable person on earth? And Musa said, me. And rightly so in his knowledge because he was a Nabi of Allah at that time. However, Allah revealed to him that there was someone more knowledgeable than him. And Musa alayhi salatu was salam traveled in search of this knowledgeable person Khidr and the story unfolds in three amazing events that take place. And we will come to the details of this. I'm just giving you a brief of the stories that are contained in the surah. Then there is the story of Dhul Qarnayn, the story of the king who combined knowledge and strength, combined them and traveled the world assisting people and spreading goodness. In his travels, he comes across a community known as Yajuj and Majuj, Gog and Magog. And now this, these are the four major stories that Allah reveals in the surah. The story of the people of the cave, the story of the man who had been blessed, the man of two gardens, the story of Musa and Khidr alayhi salatu was salam, and finally the story of Dhul Qarnayn. An interesting question, what is the relationship each one of these stories has with the fitna of the Dajjal? We spoke and we will continue discussing this. That this, sto- this surah, Surah Kahf, has an amazing relationship with the times in which we are living in. And as time unfolds and we come closer to the end of times, mankind will be faced with certain challenges and trials. And among these trials, one very serious trial is the fitna of the dark messiah the fitna of the dajjal now let's talk a little bit about this relationship with this surah dajjal will appear prior to the day of qiyamah and he will appear with four trials the trial of faith in that he will ask man to worship him instead of allah And this is a very, very challenging trial that mankind is already facing with. Now this type of trial has been mentioned and explained in the story of the people of the cave. It is strange that the stories mentioned in the surah relate to events of the past. Yet the impact of the story And the lessons drawn in the story are relating to to events of future. So the type of trial that has been mentioned and explained in the story of the people of the cave is the trial of faith, which Dajjal will challenge people. And it's not only Dajjal as the person, but also the trend that will precede his eventual emergence. Also, is the trial of wealth. The Jal will order the sky to rain. He will tempt people with his wealth. He in himself and also the trend that will precede his actual emergence will be a time of materialism where people will be tested with regards to their wealth. The trial of wealth is mentioned in the story of the owner of the two gardens. Again, an incident of the past which has an impact in the current 
and the future times. In the story of Musa and Khidr alayhi salatu was salam, there is in it the trial of knowledge. And in this trial, the Jal will try people with knowledge due to what he reveals to people of his knowledge. And also not only the Jal, but the trend that will precede his actual emergence. And this is discussed in the story of Musa and Khidr. There is also the trial of authority. As Dajjal will control major parts of the earth and the people that are the agents of Dajjal prior to the end of times will also be in control of the major parts of the earth and perhaps the major resources of earth. This trial is explained in the story of Dhul Qarnayn. So each story is linked to a trial that will be faced when the Dajjal emerges. Therefore we are taught to read the surah and also learn the lessons that are contained in the surah so that we are able to be equipped with the weapons and the ploy of our enemy who is Dajjal and also be equipped with the knowledge of the trend that will precede the actual emergence of Dajjal. And that is the trial of faith, the trial of wealth and materialism, the trial of knowledge and information, and the trial of authority. And all of these are discussed in detail in the surah, and inshallah as we go along, unveiling the secrets that are in the surah, Allah will guide us in order to implement the lessons that we learn. We conclude, insha'Allah, we continue with this in our next episode with regards to a little information about the Jal, so that when we understand these stories, we will understand it in its correct perspective. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري قرآني طوق نجاتي قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري قرآني طوق نجاتي قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري قرآني طوق نجاتي قرآني نبض حياتي قرآني طهر ذاتي قرآني عصمة أمري